Good evening to all. Uh, welcome to this, uh, this other installment of the Science Environmental Speaker Series <clears throat> for, this, uh, for this term. Uh, this evening we, has, we have as our guest speaker, Dr. Raidun Twarok, who's a professor of mathematical virology at the University of York. And just to be clear, that's York, England in the UK. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Twarok obtained a PhD in mathematical physics in Klaustal in Germany. Um, she then had a, a fellowship at the Klaus, uh, at, at, in Klaustal for a few years. And then in 2000, she received a Marie Curie fellowship that she took to the University of York until 2001. Uh, she was then offered a position in mathematics at City University in London, that's London, England. And then in 2005, the University of York realized they made a mistake by letting her go. So they hired her back <clears throat> and she has progressed through the ranks to reach basically what would be the equivalent here, a full professor of mathematical biology uh, in York. Amongst very many uh, distinctions, she's now an elected fellow of the Institute of Mathematics and its application. She, that's in 2012, she actually received a gold medal from the Institute of Mathematics and its application in 2018. And I'm glad to report that uh, she was the first woman mathematician to give the Plancherel lecture in Freiburg in 2011. And that's really, uh, a, a, really a, a short tour of, of all her honors. So without further ado, I will yield uh, I guess the screen to Dr. Twarok for her presentation and Thank welcome. You. Oh, I should add something uh, before we go there. Uh, you should see a Q&A button somewhere at the bottom of your screen and the questions will be through the Q&A button. You should be able to typeset your questions there rather than through the live chat. All right, so there you go, Dr. Twarok. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's midnight in the UK, but it's still wonderful to be on board with this wonderful series. So as you've said, I'm a mathematical physicist by training, but I'm working as a mathematical biologist now. But as you can see, my take on mathematical biology is very much influenced from my background in mathematical physics. My talk today is entitled Viral Disease Through the Lens of Geometry, and what we're going to look at today are viruses. Now, I think viruses need little introduction, unfortunately, at the moment, but perhaps less be known to most people is that by using geometry, you can actually understand how viruses form, how they evolve, and then develop novel strategies to interfere with that, and also repurpose viruses for nanotechnology applications. So in a nutshell, when I'm speaking about a virus, of course, they've been on the news, but just to recap, we are thinking about these entities that in most cases have protein containers as shown here in this little picture. But if we take one of them out and uh, resolve the surface structure even more and look more in detail at what they're looking like, then we see these very regular arrangements like on the bottom left here. This is an example of a larger viral capsid, as we call the viral protein containers that encapsulate the viral genomes. And if I were to zoom in even more on the surface, I would see these donut-like shapes that are arranged like a regular grid. We call it a lattice in mathematics. And this is very much, as you can guess, what attracted me into the topic. And taking just one of those donut shapes and looking even more into the surface structures, you see the individual proteins. They're shown here on the right as a group of six. It's called a hexamer because there are six proteins. The different colors are just there to show you where a protein starts and ends, but in this case, these are identical protein units. And these viral containers function like a Trojan horse. They contain the genetic material. They are the transport vehicle that brings the genetic material into the host cell. Now, what's really fascinating for me and which brought me 
even closer into this topic is the fact that viruses come in different shapes and sizes. I've provided here a glimpse at the viral zoo, as we might call it. And as you can see, they all have one property in common. They have the same type of symmetry. So this symmetry is called the icosahedral symmetry because it's the same symmetry uh, that also the icosahedron, the shape called icosahedron has. You see the shape here on the right hand side. There are six five fold axes or 12 vertices that are sort of going through a five fold rotational symmetry axis. On the edges of that shape, we have two fold rotational symmetry axes. And in the centers of these faces, we have three fold axes. So you see the shape at the bottom here. And all these viral structures here have that same symmetry. So overall, these are the operations that when you apply them, keep that structure, we say mathematically invariant, the structure looks the same when I operate these rotations. So the first question you might ask is why do viruses have symmetry? What is the reason? And there is an explanation that was suggested by Crick and Watson actually in 56. It is called the principle of genetic economy. So in a nutshell, this says a virus wants to minimize the length of the genome or the fragment of the genome that's needed to code for the protein building blocks of the capsid. But at the same time, wants this container to be as large as possible so it can easily fit more easily package its genome inside. And the way to do this is to use a relatively short fragment of genomic material and then repeatedly synthesize from that fragment the same type of protein over and over again and then assemble these different protein units. And as you can guess that if these units are identical, they interact in the same way everywhere across the capsid. And then naturally this results in symmetry. But why icosahedral symmetry? Why this symmetry? And this is where we can look at it a little bit more from a mathematical point of view. I know you have Hubert has introduced me. He knows about groups and symmetries. So we have a classification in mathematics of rotational symmetry groups in three dimensions. And these are embodied by objects that we call the platonic solids. You see them here on the screen. You see these objects uh, um, are different symmetries, but the dodecahedron, which I'm pointing at here on the icosahedron that we've already met, they have the same symmetry. So they're duals of each other. They have the same symmetry. This is the icosahedral symmetry. And as you can see from the number of faces of these objects, so when we have a tetrahedron, an octahedron or a cube, they have what we call smaller symmetry groups. So if, if I have one unit and I use all rotational symmetries, it produces a smaller number of copies. Or the mathematician would say it has a smaller number of symmetry operations in the group. So the rotational symmetry group of the icosahedron is 60. So the, you get 60 for the price of one, basically, by using this symmetry. So that now makes it plausible why it is that symmetry that we're seeing in virology, because if a virus evolves units that come together to form icosahedral symmetric containers, they get more of those units of the same units accommodated in that container. So the container volume will be larger for those options. So it's therefore not surprising that viruses have predominantly evolved icosahedral symmetry. And actually, if you look at all the viruses that are around, the majority has icosahedral symmetry. I should say there are also some viruses, a very smaller number of viruses, but they exist that have helical structures, so tubes. And we also have viruses that have a lipid bilayer on the outside, and uh, then the symmetry is also relaxed. But as we're going to see, they still share a lot of strategies and mechanisms with those symmetric viruses. Now, the central question of this talk will be, what are the mathematical principles that underpin virus architecture? We've already discussed that 
they all share icosid symmetry. But as we've seen when we looked at the zoo of viruses, there are actually big variations in how icosid symmetry presents itself. That, that that constraint is not sufficient to fully describe the structure. What I'm going to show you in this talk is that if we find mathematical ways of rationalizing this, then we suddenly have a handle at understanding how a virus forms, we call this virus assembly, and then we can develop novel strategies to inhibit deformation or repurpose viruses for a host of applications. And we can understand some of the constraints on viral evolution, which in my research helps us to come up with antivirus strategies or drugs that tackle the problem of drug resistance, which is one of the major obstacles to antivirus therapy. So yeah, so all of these insights then lead to novel opportunities in antivirus therapy and also in a field that's actually very large and growing, which is called virus nanotechnology, where people just use those containers to repurpose them for applications that could be drug delivery in gene therapy, this could be reagents that are brought somewhere for a certain purpose or storage. So there's quite a lot of creativity in how these viruses are being used in these applications. Now I'd like to invite you to come with me and look under the mathematical microscope. And for, for now, just look at those objects with mathematics in mind and try to understand a bit better what these building principles are. This, there is a theory that has been around since the 60s of the last century. It's called Kasper and Klug theory. That is the theory that had been proposed by Don Kasper and Aaron Klug, Aaron Klug, a Nobel Prize winner in biology, uh, to, to understand how larger viral capsids could be organized that have more than 60 protein units. We've already said that if something is organized with acrosidal symmetry, then there is a multiple of 60, which comes from the symmetry group. So if I have one unit, then if it has that symmetry, they're actually partner copies, and in total there are 60 copies. But we know that viruses can go, have various length scales. They're very small viruses, mainly plant viruses, but viruses can get actually quite complicated. And the largest viruses you can almost see under light microscope, they're so large. In fact, when they were discovered, people thought that these might not be viruses, they might be bacteria, but then it turned out these are just really giant viruses. So there is a very, very big spectrum. And the question therefore is, what are the principles according to which viruses are organized that are a bit larger and have more than 60 building blocks? And the first mathematical theory to address this was invented by Kasper and Klug. So what they noticed, looking again at this example of a viral container that we've seen at the start of my talk, is that these are formed from clusters of six proteins except at 12 positions, which are the five-fold axes. So the cluster sitting at the five-fold axis has obviously only five proteins, but everywhere else we have a six-fold arrangement. So therefore they said these viral architectures should be describable in terms of hexagonal lattices. And this is just a little bit of, of school mathematics if you want. You have a hexagonal lattice, a hexagonal grid, a, a planar grid that's formed from hexagons see it here in gray. And then you ask the question, can I take the surface of an icosahedron? I should remind you that the icosahedron has 20 triangular faces. And in fact, if I were to cut this shape out along this rim here, and then put it together as a cardboard model, then I would see a shape like this, which is an icosahedron. So I can basically ask the question how I can embed, we say, the surface of the icosahedron into a hexagonal lattice such that when I'm closing it up, I have no gaps or overlaps. And you get that if you put the vertices of your triangles in the centers of hexagons, and then you allow rotations and scalings. And that's what they did. So they have the famous series, T number series in biology, where they say, what are all the op options in which you can organize a viral capsid with a hexagonal surface lattice? 
Now, I wouldn't be here today talking to you if that was the end of the story, and indeed it's not, because there are outliers that drew me into the field and actually required new mathematics to be developed. And here are just two examples for the type of outlier I want to discuss today. So the first one is a cancer-causing virus. It's called papillomavirus. You might have heard about it because there's a vaccination program at the moment against papillomaviruses in teenagers. So these viruses have not only got these five-fold clusters at the particle five-fold axis as required by symmetry, but every other position is also five-fold. So that's obviously unexpected from the point of view of a surface lattice that is formed from hexagons. Then we have very large viruses, a phage, phage basilixa, I should say a phage is a virus that infects bacteria and phages are by far the most abundant species in the, in the oceans alone. We have so many phages in our gut, we have phages, so phages are really important. And the large phages, as you can see here, are not just organized by, with hexagons, but there is triangles and hexagons. And the question then is, oh, what else is possible? What is mathematically sound? What can we have? So this, these two cases basically tell us that we need a new theory of icosahedral virus architecture that contains Kasper Fluke theory as a special case, but can also encompass all these other scenarios. Now let's start with the first and let's try to understand what the mathematical challenge really is. And I've got an analogy here for you to, to warm you up to what, what is our problem. So the problem basically is akin to trying to tile your bathroom with tiles. If you tile your bathroom as probably most of your bathrooms are with squares, then you can infinitely tile this. But if you were using pentagons, then you would create little gaps here that aren't filled by another pentagon. So this is something we call in mathematics the crystallographic restriction. It's a non-crystallographic symmetry because you cannot take that building block and glue it together without gaps in this case, or it would be overlaps for other shapes that are non-crystallographic. So we have another look here. We've already looked at this example. This is the virus that has the five-foot clusters throughout, this papilloma virus. So you can already guess that the mathematical challenge is indeed similar. And yes, it's, there are other problems in physics, for instance, that are of a similar nature. So Schechtman discovered alloys that are called quasi-crystals that are, for instance, made from aluminium and manganese. And these alloys in a diffraction pattern show a non-crystallographic symmetry. You can see here, this is sort of a tenfold rotational um, symmetry. It's a decagon. Um, in here. So um, the question is, how can this be modeled mathematically because it's a non-crystallographic symmetry? And one option to tackle this is via tilings that are non-periodic. So you have here um, a Penrose tiling, it's a famous Penrose tiling. So imagine you put an axis through the center here where my cursor points, then there is a five-fold symmetry in this case. So locally everything, or actually this is the global axis, everything maps. But then if you go for it, see you have locally five-fold symmetry, but if you go a bit further out, at some point you see it's actually no longer working. And um, so you have lots of local symmetry but you, you don't necessarily have global symmetries. Exactly what we see in the virus. We have the global symmetries, but then we have the, the local symmetries in between as well. So we can already see that there is some relation in the mathematics. And indeed, you can cast this into a tiling problem. So you can ask the question, is there a surface tessellation in terms of a defined number of shapes? We've already decided it can't be just one type of shape. It must be more than that. That would accurately describe this structure. And indeed, on the right-hand side is the corresponding solution for this virus here. So you need two, two shapes. One is a kite, as we call it, and the other one is a romp in this case. Now, there is an interpretation to this, which is quite important from a biological point of view, because we interpret every kite such that a protein unit is positioned in um, a corner, which is 
associated with a, a five-fold vertex, so five coordinated vertex in the tiling. So here is three coordinated, there is no protein, but five coordinate is there. So in this way, it will tell me exactly where the proteins are, but even more beautifully, it tells me how they interact. So proteins have uh, we call them amino acid chains. So it's like, think about a ball of wool, which was with an arm. And these C-terminal arms, these arms, they can interact, they can be reached out to the next protein and interact. Now, if you have a kite shape like this here, then you have three proteins on it. And the way they interact is, say, this protein here on the left-hand side would extend an arm to one of the uh, other proteins on the plaquette and would receive one from another. So maybe receive from this one and extend to this one, a bit like a daisy chain. So it's a trimer interaction, it's an interaction between three. But on the, um, on the rump tiles, we have only two proteins and they would extend to and receive from the same partner protein and arm. So it's a really different interaction patterns. The interactions across the uh, cups that surface are no longer the same. And one of the key assumptions of Caspar Kluck theory was that the local interactions must all be the same. And then a hexagonal lattice is appropriate to describe the structure. But as we see here, from the interaction pattern alone, this is not the same for every protein. Quasicon glucot is quasi-equivalent, so we don't have any quasi-equivalence anymore, but we can rationalize this with these tiling approaches. Now, to cut a long story short, we can do these in two dimensions. I say 2D because it's the surface of a virus. It's the surface, the surface structure. So it's a two-dimensional surface. But then we can see those surfaces as being part of three-dimensional tilings. Imagine you do a Penrose tiling now. So this is actually a Penrose tiling in the background here. These are the three-dimensional Penrose shapes. You do these structures, and then you take spherical sections in them. Then you get these surface structures, but you get more. You get actually information at different radial levels. So here, what you see displayed in color in all of these pictures are the atomic positions of real viruses. People in biology, scientists in biology, determine those structures uh, either via crystallography or cryo microscopy. They upload those coordinates, you can download them and superimpose them on your models. So that's what I've done here. So you see real viral structures superimposed on the mathematical models. And what you can see here, maybe also in this kind of slab view, is that it tells me gives me information about the thickness of the structure, about more details of the structure. And indeed, you could ask the question, is there a way of constructing the vertex sets, so the corners of these shapes, from a group theoretical point of view? And indeed there is. And that's just a sort of placeholder at the top for the idea of it all. So on the bottom of the shape, you see your Penrose tiling again. Then you see your decagon superimposed. People know a bit about roots. It's a root system of a coxeter group, but we don't want to go there because it's a general talk. We just say there are mathematical structures that you can picture in this case as being a translation and rotation of a shape. And if you strip all the lines away that you're creating, and you just look at the little um, vertices, then these have a relation to the vertices of these um, tilings. So you have to take my word for it at this point. There's uh, several PhD theses on this slide, which I'm glossing over because it's more about telling you the, the broader picture of what you can do with this. So basically, you, you therefore get then, if you do the same thing that I've shown you here in 2D and 3D, you get these 3D structures, and you see how nicely they're mapping around. This is one protein, a pentamer of this polyoma virus. It's again, this virus, a 3D rendering of this virus is zoomed in on a five foot axis of it. And you see how now this actually really nicely maps around the boundaries. And here's a different virus. What you see on the outside is the protein shell. And then inside you see the density that corresponds to the genetic material, which in this case is RNA. It's an RNA virus, it's actually a phage. And you see it color coded just so you see the radial levels is basically the density where, where the uh, RNA sits. And what you already see here is it's not densely filled. There's quite a lot of void space in this. And 
you the fact that you see the density at all means there must be some pattern some regularity because otherwise with these imaging techniques especially when they're based on icosahedral averaging as this one is you would see nothing unless it reinforces a signal that is present in different viruses so let's therefore look a bit more into the power of these point arrays. So here is yet another virus, an um, insect virus, paracotovirus, which has a very interesting um, internal organization. So what you see here in orange is the genomic RNA, again in this case, and outside the protein container. And we try to understand in how far our mathematical models can tell us something about this. So I start a movie now that takes the point array that corresponds to this virus and superimposes it on, again, the, the protein structure that's been derived from the data. So as you see, we have vertices on all the turrets of this, and which is already quite remarkable because this, there are not so many point arrays you could create of the correct nature, we have a classification, we have papers that classify them, and there's not so much around. So the question is already, the fact that we find this is quite interesting. So now what we're doing is we're slubbing in and out for you to see a little bit more about that structure. And now we're going to zoom in on only six proteins and take everything else out. And at this moment, we can afford to put the fine details, the sheets and helices of the proteins inside. So now let's look from the side, it's a side view on our container, and we're now going to bring in those vertices that mathematically are package and parcel of each other. So they come as a group. I cannot cherry pick one of them without the others because they're all mathematically related. And as you can see, they are encasing in some way these, these protein structures. And now there comes in an associated piece of RNA and that has not been used at all. It's a prediction how it looks. It's not been used to select the model. And as you can see, what's really striking is that these so-called minor grooves, these small kind of grooves of the RNA, you find these vertices from the model. So the model orchestrates at the same time the inside and outside the RNA and the protein shell of the virus. And what's really interesting for a mathematician is if you develop a mathematical technique or a mathematical structure, you don't want it to be so designed for a specific application that has no generic or wider value. And indeed, we went there for two of my postdoc and PhD students were tasked with looking in how far this actually also describes um, carbon cage structures called fullerenes. There are actually fullerenes that are nested like Russian dolls. So you have these different, this is a fullerene cage with 540 carbon atoms, with 240 carbon atoms and 60 carbon atoms. And they come in this nested arrangement. You could see it in the slab view. You would see where the shells are sitting. And Jess and Pierre looked at um, applying the mathematics there and actually showed in this, that in the same way as these, um, these structures here describe all radial levels collectively, they describe the whole carbon onion collectively. So there is it's a way of describing icosidal structures at different radial levels collectively. Now, I think I've now introduced enough of the mathematics to be able to segue into applications. And the first thing I would like to do is to show you how this has helped us to code break, to find a code, a hidden code within viral genomes that instructs viruses how to form its container. So this is the Enigma machine. Here's a picture of the Enigma machine. So a viral Enigma, how can we solve this? Before we're going there, I would like to introduce the idea of virus assembly. So this code, as I say, it will give instructions how to assemble, but I'd like to introduce you first to this concept of virus assembly. So we said there is this protein container. This is formed from identical copies. And already without the genomic material, you can quite learn quite a lot about how such a virus might assemble. And this is a beautiful movie, which I'm always using in lectures when I'm introducing virus assembly. It's courtesy of Art Olsen at the scripts. And this is, I have my own thing here. I don't know if you can see this. So it's this, this little unit. It has 12 units with magnets. You can Take it. Take it. And the 
and now you shake it it becomes together so art has done this much more beautifully here so i'll show you this utilizing solid printed models of virus components and magnets representing the attractive forces between them we can produce a physical analog capable of self-assembly by random shaking the model demonstrates not only how nature accomplishes this feat, but can show some of the subtle characteristics of the stochastic assembly. Notice that the subassemblies form and break apart en route to the most stable structure. The strength of the shaking is analogous to the temperature of the molecular environment. If it's too hot, the virus will break apart. If it is in the proper range, assembly will take place at an optimal pace. So for many years, people therefore thought virus assembly could be studied in a test tube, ignoring all other components. And, oh no, I want to go on, yeah. But what I'm going to show you now is that that is only part of the story. A clue is, for instance, when you look at viruses where you only take the protein components you assemble, it sometimes takes maybe quite a long while for it to assemble, it does, but it takes a time. Whereas if you have the genetic material in, in the mix as well, then assembly is much more efficient. And we, we wanted to understand why this is. And what we've discovered, and I talk you through how we discovered this, but I first want to show you where we're going with this. So in the movie, we just saw the virus and we saw the building blocks, which are here, these blue little units. But what we've discovered is that in the genome of a virus, there are sequence snippets that can be very cryptic, very sparse, that when presented in these shapes, we call them secondary structures, these are stem loops. So genomes self-interact and they make these shapes. And if they are presented in equivalent positions of such elements, so in this case, in the loops, we call them the loops of a stem loop, the loops. So if they're all in the loops in similar positions in the loop of a stem loop, then they can act collectively to promote the formation of the container. So what we actually have found that these genomes not only code for the protein units, for the protein components, but they also encode instructions of how to use them. And this is a bit like when you have an IKEA shelf, you get all your components of the shelf, but you get an instruction manual with them to know how to put it together. And this is joint work with my experimental collaborator, Peter Stockley at the University of Leeds. So how have we actually identified these units? So now we have to come back to the mathematics and remember that I showed you that we have these point arrays that are mapping around the material boundaries. So on the outside here again, we're seeing the protein shell and on the inside, we're seeing the genomic RNA and these, these point array models that, that encapsulate um, or encode all of this arrangement. But now if you just for a moment focus on these inter faces between the genetic material and the protein shell, then what you will find is that in these positions, you have some of these vertices sitting. So basically on the outside here, you see the protein shell, these orangey blue things I see with the stem loops of the RNA, and then you have these vertices sitting here. So mathematically, you can abstract this. You can just say, okay, if I connect vertices that are neighboring or neighboring proteins um, where we have vertices to connect them, you get this kind of polyhedral shell. So you connect to the nearest neighbors or nearest neighbor across the twofold. And what you find is that these are the binding sites, the potential binding sites of these stem loops. But the RNA is, in a sense, constrained by being sort of a long piece of string. I um, mean, being sort of the stem loops are connected along the sequence. So technically, because these are three coordinated vertices, you can only sort of meet a vertex and then move to, to another vertex. Um, but, but, but you can't meet the same vertex twice because there's only one place for such a stem loop to bind. So this means that overall the structure we are looking at is something like a path that 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 goes along edges meets vertices. And if we have all vertices occupied, then we have a full Hamiltonian path. But we can also have partial Hamiltonian paths, of course, but the extremum or the, 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 the optimal solution is obviously a full Hamiltonian path.
Now, how do we have to interpret this? And we have to be very careful. I'm not saying, because that's a mistake people often made when I started talking about these ideas, I'm not saying the RNA is crawling along the surface, not at all. And here's an example. So you can have two stem loops in contact, they're neighboring stem loops, but there is RNA, is excess RNA that, that extends towards the interior of the capsid, comes back up. That's possible. Indeed, this is taken from a structure from this virus. That's indeed the case. But mathematically, it doesn't matter for us as long as they are the neighboring stem loops in the along the linear sequence, that's good enough for the argument that will follow. And indeed, the way again to interpret this is you think about this path, think about the path having in each vertex these little stem loops and um, organize the structure in this way. Now, what this says to the mathematician is that there are geometric constraints on the organization of the viral genome inside the capsid. It's not completely free, it's orchestrated by these contacts. So technically, therefore, this is a very important piece of information that we can use. And it almost means that viruses play a very old game that Hamilton has designed. So Hamilton, I know a lot of people in the, in the audience today are physicists, know about Hamiltonians, but it's not that concept. It's another one. Hamiltonian paths are the idea you have a polyhedral shell, you want to read, meet every vertex precisely once, and now you have to travel between them to achieve that. It's also known as the traveling salesman problem. So this is a dodecahedron as a Schlegel diagram, or if you don't know what it is, take your dodecahedron and squash it flat on the, uh, on the plane, and then basically use this as the same connectivity, the edges, as in a dodecahedron. Cahedron. And now you can play a traveling salesman problem. You can say, so how can I make a path along this so that I meet every city as a, my, as a traveling salesman, and I, but I don't um, visit them twice. So that's a Hamiltonian path. And Hamilton actually sold this as a board game at, at that time. So it was actually entertaining people um, in the 19th century. And so, so, but coming back to our virus problem now, so we have the Hamiltonian path, and, but what does it tell us actually? And here comes something really important because you can do a bioinformatics analysis of the viral genome, but because it's such a sparse motif, if you look for, for a repeat of a motif, you're likely not finding it because it has to be presented in the correct environment, in the same stem loop uh, positions, it is potentially very sparse. But if you have these, um, the, the, these Hamilton pass ideas, you have constraints. So what we've done then is a constraint optimization, if you wish. So you have different options. Um, it's just a, like a big Sudoku with a little bit of a twist. So you, you're asking combinatorially what's possible and you read, read things out. And again, long story short, so you, there are certain areas which are more constrained, others are not so much. So there is a part that's really absolutely constrained and other parts we just showed, you find a solution there, but there is also possibility for variation. And all of this turns out now with more imaging uh, results to be true. So again, from the previous slide, the way to read these little shapes that I've got here, these are the stem loops in contact with the shell. And, and this is the com as placeholder for the combinatorics that comes from the geometry. So there's a little nice, beautiful little um, um, overview article um, followed the yellow brick road, referring to the fact that these Hamiltonian paths uh, are displayed in yellow in these publications, and it shows how to how to get there. So this has enabled us then to discover the following fact, that there are multiple dispersed RNA sequence structure motifs, and we call them packaging signals, because they're important for the packaging of the genome, that share a consensus motif for the capsid protein. So there's a recognition motif for the capsid protein. But as you can see in this example, they are very variable, and the motif similarity sparse is an AXXA for them. So it's... Um, basically not so easy to find unless you have something to go by to do so. 
But starting with the more simple viruses over the years, we've actually been able to identify packaging signals in some heavy hitting viruses as well. Um, I see that's yeah, hepatitis B is here as well. The hepatitis B is an interesting case, it's classed as a DNA virus, but actually it packages the genome in the form of RNA as pre-genomic RNA and only converts it into DNA inside the container. So it almost borrowed this mechanism and went at length to then convert later just so it could benefit from that um, mechanism. And there is, uh, so a SARS-CoV-2, I should say, is a special case in the sense that it's not one of these classical icosahedral uh, capsid arrangement. It has a membrane in which these, these S protein, M protein, and so on are anchored. So it's not quite the same, but there is a variation of that mechanism. And knowing about the mechanism in these other viruses has helped us to recognize it and find it. So again, and it's as, um, a twist on the same theme. So, but now we're here, obviously today we have a, have a mathematical or biophysical slant on the talk. So the next question we therefore want to answer, how does this assembly code work? We know it's there, but, but how does it work? And an analogy is very helpful here, and that starts with protein folding. There is a paradox called Leventhal's paradox, which basically says if you have a protein in the, the amino acid sequence of the protein extended, and it wants to fold to become its what we call native state, so the end product we want, then um, it would take the time of the universe to try all the little folds it can do on the way, but it doesn't take that long. So clearly there is a way, and we was usually describing so-called protein funnels. So it's basically organized so that it's like on its path very efficiently towards that native state. Now, the same problem we have in virus assembly, especially for larger viruses. We have a lot of components, and there are many multiple ways of gluing them together in different forms and ways. So why is the virus not running in kinetic traps? Why is the virus not nucleating a lot and never finishing anything? So it's a similar thing. There must be something that dictates it, and you can already guess where we're going. Our hypothesis is that this is actually achieved by the packaging signal. So we use a model system and <laughs> all the physicists in the audience will know we like our spherical cows. So here is a very nice, beautiful virus. It's again, all the atomic positions. But if you look at it, you see that the mathematical essence of it is a dodecahedron. It has these five-fold blocks that come together. So in order to understand how this mechanism works, I can as well use my spherical cow. And I can say, let's just try first how this works on a dodecahedron. And then we, what we learn, we can then transfer to other scenarios. But now first we want to understand that. So what we've done then is we take a dodecahedron, its building blocks are pentagons, and we have a fictitious RNA, genomic material, which has 12 binding sites. So we simplify our life by saying there's just one binding site per pentamere. And we will, in, 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 these, uh, in the future, we will here now represent these uh, packaging signals in their order in which they occur from the five prime to the three prime end, so from one end to the other end of the RNA, as little spheres, and we color code them. The color coding is uh, in bands by affinity to the capsule protein. Then we have reactions that are relatively simple. The reactions are it can bind or unbind. And when two proteins are bound to neighboring um, uh, packaging sites, so packaging signals, then they can interact with each other. You see this here, they, they are neighboring sites and they interact. Of course, they can fall on and off. And that's been done by Eric when he was still a postdoc in the team. Now he is a lecturer himself. But um, that, that sort of work that we did there. And um, basically what we, what, what is the, um, it's a, a very complex outcome. You have a lot of simulations, but what helps us is to understand the geometric constraints a bit better. So here, obviously the, we said our shape is a dodecahedron. What is then the Hamiltonian path? Well, the Hamiltonian path is defined in this case by 
all the possible connections between neighboring binding sites, which in this case is an icosahedron. So it might be a bit confusing. So the, the protein shell is the dodecahedron and the polyhedron that now describes the Hamilton, Hamiltonian path built up is an icosahedron. And here you see one possible Hamiltonian path. It's like a spiral along this, um, this icosahedron. And this is important because that tells us about intermediates and how they are connected. So just from a protein point of view, these two intermediates would be identical, but from the point of view of the interaction with the RNA, not so much. There is actually a difference between this and this arrangement. So the RNA breaks symmetry in an interesting way. So what have we done then? Just let I invite you just to do this, this little experiment with us. So we are doing these stochastic simulations 30,000 times. And what we're doing each time, we are varying randomly this color coding. So we have basically three types of affinity. What's green is this very strong. It likes very much to bind to a protein. What's blue, intermediate. And what's red is a relative weak affinity. So we are playing by randomly permuting or changing the numbers as well, the relative numbers of these colors. And if we do this 30,000 times, and each time we, we on the x-axis, we say how many percentage have assembled fully and not been trapped somewhere. And and on the y-axis, the frequency of occurrence of that, you see something really interesting. So this RNA, which I call RNA1, is actually very, very good at assembling, but the other one, not so much. So what we already learn is that the distribution of affinities alone, so assuming that they're in the same positions, but their affinity for capsule protein changes. And if we do so, we see that we get very different yields which is really interesting. So we see basically that these, 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 uh, these are important. We understand this quite well. We understand it has to do with nucleation. It has to do with kinetic traps. But for the sake of this talk, perhaps it's enough to say these packaging signals are tuned like knobs on a radio. So you can fine tune it. So you want to tune to maximal assembly, to maximal um, best assembly. And you can do this by playing with this affinity for the code protein. And when we are on optimal settings, then these instructions are really efficient and our IKEA manual is really good. So there is almost no, no real analogy to IKEA because IKEA gives you just one instruction manual. I guess they give you the optimized one. They don't show you the ones where the shaft breaks down or doesn't fully assemble. But, but here we have many, many, and we just the best one is the one that IKEA would give you to build your shelf. So that's really interesting because let's think about what we've actually discovered. Um, there is a beautiful quotation by Sir Peter Medavar, who said, a virus is simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in protein. So basically the idea is there is a container and the RNA is inside. But our discovery is actually saying that the news is even worse because these genomes not only are passive passengers, but actually they play vital cooperative roles in the formation of these viral capsules, again, akin to these IKEA instruction manuals. So there's another way of looking at this. And I think that my colleague, Peter Stockley, actually came up with this analogy. So it's really due to him. But I think it's another way of thinking about this IKEA instruction idea. So this is the genome of this bacteriophage MS2. Here is the virus seen from the outside. It's capsid. And he said it's like a self-packing suitcase. Basically, if you, if you just try to stuff all your clothing into it and you do this badly, then depending on how much clothing you want to stuff, it's basically not closing up. But if you have these packaging signals that tell it exactly the instructions, fold here, fold there, do this, do that, you can actually make it so tightly packed that you get your suitcase formed. So that's another way of, of viewing this. But let's try to understand from a geometric point of view, why are these packaging signals so good? What do they do? And what we understand here is that um, is something that I've glossed over, which is the so-called protein rub. So you can do these simulations when you are slowly adding more capsid protein. So you're not putting all the protein in at once, but you add it slowly. 
or you just have your RNA inside and put everything in at once. So that's called the protein rump. If I rump, I put it carefully in. If I'm not rumping the black, I'm throwing it in. And what you see is the, the, the what I'm showing here is on the x-axis all the Hamiltonian paths, which are proxies for the order in which protein units are um, sequestered to the as intermediates to the growing capsid shell. So you see that there, there are in total combinatorially 1,230 options. But what we what we're seeing here is if we are um, basically doing the slow titration, only some of them occur with high frequency and the others not so much and some not at all. Whereas if we don't do this, then everything comes up more or less similarly um, at, across the board with small differences. So what we're learning here from this is that geometry is again a way of a bookkeeping device to rationalize what makes virus assembly efficient when these packaging signals are present and the proteins are ramping up, it tells me that then we have these very specific geometric um, um, arrangements in which these viruses are assembling. And you can already see that, that it's really a very small subset of the total that's being used. And if you look at them in even more detail, you see this is where maybe the the, the helicity is changing at the bottom, so small changes. There is a very, in all of them, there is a principally similar way in which these viruses arrange themselves. And we can understand this from an energetic point of view. These often are such that on a protein level, you have more bonds being formed. So here's an example. I have one unit. Now I have two units together, but then I have choices. I can make um, this unit, which forms two new bonds, but I can also form this, which only forms one more bond. And basically the packaging signal favor the more favorable energetics for the pathways, which might explain why they are so much more efficient. And here is again the Hamiltonian path um, for this particular virus. This is the bacteriophage MS2 again. And now we understand how this whole work, thing works. People see these signatures in nature in Quarium, even with averaging, because there's only a small subset under these conditions of pass. So they reinforce themselves across an ensemble of particles. Now, what is actually a practical use of what we've got? Well, is we have a tremendous tool in your hands because you can repurpose purpose these viral assembly instructions. You can ask the question, if in gene therapy, say, I want to package a specific type of therapeutic RNA, not a viral RNA, an RNA I need to, to, to uh, as a remedy against a certain illness, but I want to bring it where it is needed in the body, then I can use viruses as so-called vectors. It's not a mathematical vector, so it's a container, it's a vector, biological vector. And um, you basically package it inside. The virus has what we call tropism. The virus has the ability to enter specific target cells. So hepatitis virus enters hepatitis cells. They have this tropism for a certain cell type. So I can use these viral shells to transport something. But my bottleneck is how do I entice or convince these RNAs to package efficiently into the correct containers? And that's where we are repurposing this assembly code. We're working together with industrial partners. We're working together with gene therapy specialists in London, um, world leading gene therapists to, to exploit our invention in this context. But the field of virus nanotechnology is even bigger, is even vaster. So here is a whole um, range of viruses that are currently being used in so-called virus nanotechnology. Nicole Steinmetz is an expert. Um, she has got wonderful um, overview articles. I just give you one here where she shows you the, the plethora of things you really could do with things like that. But now again, I want to bring back my mathematical microscope and look once more at these structures because we haven't exploited the mathematics fully and there's more we can learn. So let's look at specifically those viruses here that, um, that are in Nicole's review and that are being frequently used. They are all icosahedral. 
And according to Kasper and Kluge's theory, they are all in the same classification. It's called a T equals three. They have 180 proteins. So everything that has the same number of proteins in Kasper and Kluge's theory gets the same type of description. Um, but obviously there are differences to them. And the question is, have they got any bearings on, say, the ability of these viruses to fall apart? We've spoken about assembling, but there's also the need to fall apart. And in order to answer this, a bit more mathematics is needed first. This is some work I've done with Anthony Luke in, we have a Nature Commons paper in 2019, where we are addressing this problem. So we are asking here the question, let's revisit Kasper and Kluge theory, and let's understand what their basic assumptions were, what needs generalizing, and what are the correct mathematical concepts to achieve this. And what we've learned here is that Kasper and Kluge use a hexagonal lattice, but actually the only thing that is important from a biological point of view is that you have the same vertex structure. So if I look at the corner of my tessellation, these corners, they should all look the same. I look for lattices where these corners are the same. Why is that? Because this means the local interactions are always the same. If I have similar building blocks, they have the same interaction. But it can be, as here on the second one, that I maybe don't have two identical proteins, I have multiple copies of two species, and they interact. So, but still, then when they meet, they will do the same thing. So, mathematically, this means I'm interested in all lattices where the plaquettes, where my faces, are regular shapes. So there are triangles, hexagons, any regular shape, but such that my vertices, my corners here, are identical. And these have been classified by Kepler. These are the Archimedean lattices. Um, you can write them all down. But then not all of them are compatible with using this icosahedral construction, because remember, we still need to embed the surface of the icosahedron so be able to cut this out, close it up, and make a nice round shape that's then really a model of a virus. And there are only, in addition to the one that Kasper and Kluke already did, three others but they exist. So what we've done is we've classified all of that and we have shown how they interdigitate. So we have basically expanded the Kasper Kluge series by more models. And what's really exciting for us, there were some viruses that were seen in nature via crystallography, via cryoEM, but they, they were having so-called forbidden protein numbers because Kasper Kluge theory, a theory that works with the hexagonal lattice only allows certain numbers of proteins, but people saw other numbers, but now we can rationalize them, we understand. But what's even more exciting for me is that for a given um, number of proteins, you can have different principally different types of layouts, and that's going to become important for our applications now. So let's look at that fact a little bit more. So I'm taking now capsid architectures with 180 proteins, because these are typically what we see in these small plant viruses. And so here on the top, we see the tilings. So this is a triangulation. This is Kasper Klug because it's kind of related to the hexagon lattice. But then we can also use these kite shapes. Just everything is a kite shape and everything is a rhomb shape. I give you an example for each. So they all occur in nature. But notably, these uh, tilings that follow the kite shapes are very rare. So you see many, many more of the triangles and of the um, of these uh, rhomb shapes. So that's the tiling. The tiling tells me basically what the protein building blocks are, or, or, which are not individual proteins, but groups of proteins. But now the question is, how do they bond with each other? And now we're taking the dual graphs here. So the dual means I put a vertex in the center of each shape. And then I make an edge across all the, um, the, the, these, these edges to the neighbors. So I put the vertex in the center and I connect to all of its neighbors. So if I do this, I get this graph on the bottom. This is basically the dual tiling. It tells me vertices are plaquettes, vertices are protein building blocks, and edges are bonds. And now what's really interesting, we want to see these principally different things 
are they the same for cargo release or are they different? And you can already guess that they're different. I would want to, to quantify this in a minute. But that's, I, should, I should stress that this is really, really important because in applications, if you have a cargo or you have some remedy you want to deliver with them, but you want at the right moment for the thing to fall apart, release your remedy. You don't want it to be stuck inside. So for this reason, you really need to understand how they behave. And now comes something really interesting. Look at these three shapes from the point of view of their geometric descriptors, as we say. So the descriptors we're using is the number of tiles, the number of plaquettes. There are 60 tiles of triangles, 90 rhombs, and 60 kites. So the numbers are the same for the kite and the triangular tiling, whereas they're more numerous, of course, for the rhomb tiling. However, when it comes to the edges, the rhomb tiling has four neighbors, so it's four coordinated, four edges per tile. So has the kite for edges per tile, but here the triangular tiling is different. So you see that there is always a property that two of them share, but then it shares another property with another. It's almost like a trimer interaction, like a daisy chain. So now what we've done is percolation theory. So percolation theory in a nutshell, we are looking at lattices and we are wanting to understand how easily do they break apart when I put uh, bits when I take bits out. So basically, when, when do they fragment? When do they fall into clusters? Here, our lattice is um, a spherical lattice. So we're taking, say, this shape here. Um, and we have done it with bonds or we have done it with plaquettes. So let's start with the plaquettes. We are basically having our shape. We have our 60 triangles. Now start randomly throwing them out and see how many do I have to randomly take out on average before this thing falls into two parts. And that's what we're showing here. So we count how many different disconnected components we have on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we look at how much we've removed. And we do it fractional because these are different numbers of, of building blocks. And we must make them comparable. This we only can do by normalizing. So we say the fraction of the total removed, and then it's comparable. So that's what we're doing here. And long story short, these dashed lines tell me the first moment where a structure falls apart. And we find something really interesting. Look, the triangular tiling has the smallest value here. It's most readily falling apart. The kite tiling is rather, rather resilient to release. So it's very, very stable. And the rom tiling is in the middle. And that's really interesting because it gives us insights perhaps into why in in, in virology, we so, see so very few of these kite tilings. And if we see them, we see them in smaller viruses. And the larger the virus gets, we are not seeing this anymore. And it seems to be not very uh, compatible with the life cycles of viruses um, that need to, fall, need to fall apart somehow. And especially um, in the smaller viruses, we have a lot of um, the need for them to fall apart, but also so in larger viruses. Now, then, but still the question is, we have these different uh, structures. And I have not got this in here, but in our paper, we then show that this trend prevails for larger uh, viruses. So if you basically have viruses with more than 180 proteins that are organized according to a triangulation or ROM tiling, that same thing prevails. So very interesting, we have now a pointer for the nanotech application. We understand that geometry really matters for release. And now I'd like to bring together, we had a science paper last summer where we brought all of this together in some way. So the viral genome and the capsid ge geometry work hand in glove. And it's actually really, really beautiful experiments in, the, in Hilbert's lab at the ETH Zurich. Stefan Tetter is the first author in, in Don's lab. And uh, I described to you what's happened here. So what they've done is this is not a container from a virus, but this is a container from a bacterial protein in that also likes to make um, icosahedral containers and these are dodecahedral in this case. They have engineered the protein as a cyclic permutation. You can cut it in place and fuse it in places such that there was an arm that could reach inside the interior of the container. And then they crafted on this the packaging signal of um, on the messenger RNA, so on the RNA sequence that codes for the protein building block, they crafted the packaging signal of bacteriophage lambda, so it's an engineered system. 
And also the, on, the, on the protein itself, they had the partner, the protein partner for it. So this system was therefore engineered to package its own messenger RNA with one packaging signal, one contact that is akin to a bacteriophage lambda. Oops, I don't know why I did this. I wasn't meant to do this. So then um, basically what they do is then they, they are making directed evolution experiments. They do evolution in a laboratory environment. They evolve it, which means they are um, copying it. Some errors creep in. Um, they assess those, those genomes for their packaging ability. If they are not closing properly, there's something called a nuclease. The nuclease eats away at the RNA that's not protected by protein. So the, that's how you weed out uh, capsids that are not fully formed. And you do this many, many times. So basically you do laboratory evolution with selection for containers that form well. And they observe two beautiful things. Number one, the longer they do it, the larger the particle morphologies get. You literally see in a laboratory environment how smaller viruses evolve into larger viruses. But they also had a puzzle. They came to a point where the particle morphology wasn't changing anymore, but the at this point, packaging efficiency went up still. So what is the mechanism? And that's where we got talking because um, I suggested that this could be due to packaging signals and we've set out to explore this together. So basically here is again, these, these, um, the protein evolution. So you see how during these experiments, the, it gets larger and larger and larger as a container. And what happens here for the exper uh, experimentalists among you or the virologists among you, I know we have a mixed audience here today. Um, this is so-called domain swap. So they, they swap a domain between proteins. From a mathematical point of view, it ex explores or exploits a degree of freedom that we've proposed in our paper here, which is that these lattices that are not just uh, hexagonal lattices, but they have these combinations, and I don't know why this is set to go forward, they have these uh, combinations of hexagons and triangles. These can be gyrated, which means that the relative size of the triangle lengths, edge lengths, and of the hexagonal edge lengths varies. So the original letters, they are the same, but here the triangle edge is larger. So it's called gyration. You can also make it smaller, and it's also gyration. So these lattices then account for these structures that have not been seen before. But this is also, um, and we propose that this is a degree of freedom that viruses might exploit when they want to evolve from smaller to larger structures. So they start to gyrate, but first they, they use the same proteins, but just occupy these additional things. We thought at that time that's maybe because they evolve an extra domain, but they can also obviously do a domain swap as we've seen here. But then now comes what I mentioned before, but then they come at a point where the geometry does not change anymore. But uh, so you see these, these evolutionary steps here that uh, sort of take note of. So around one, two, three, or four. Um, and then um, on here is basically shown when they sequence the content of these particles, how my, what they're finding. So they find either from the E. coli, that's the bacterium in which they are doing the experiments, they find in their um, uh, RNA from this, then they find from the plasmid RNA, but then the nucleocapsid RNA is really the cognate RNA, the RNA of the pro, um, that codes for the protein. And from three to four, the geometry doesn't change anymore, but the packaging efficiency goes up. And the same holds here when you look for full length messenger RNAs. Again, you see that this is dramatically going up. And then, so with two postdocs in my team here, we did then the analysis on this uh, Peter's team that did the XRF experiments. So we, we, we therefore analyzed the structures and we found that additional packaging signals had evolved a cassette of packaging signals in specific distances so that they cooperatively could act has evolved in this step from the less efficient to the more efficient packaging, which is really exciting because it tells us that we really can tune packaging signal efficiencies. Um, you can tune this um, it, it's so, to, to achieve better assembly properties. And that's what we are currently exploiting in our applications with partners. So to, to, to really use this, this uh, degree of freedom here. 
Now, how about DNA viruses? I just want to say a few words about them. So some larger viruses, especially these phages that are very abundant, they have these so-called packaging motors. So they are not packaging the genetic material at the same time as they are forming the container. So you could say, obviously, here, these classical ideas of packaging signals don't work. So what do these viruses do? And I'm fortunate enough to have a colleague from the US Professor Carol Teschke is an experimentalist. She's spending four months in my team with the Fulbright Fellowship at the moment. And we are working on, she's an expert for P22, is one of those phages. And we're working on this and together with my postdoc, Father Trate. We are working on models to understand this. So this is the virus. So first of all, what's very interesting, these hexagonal clusters are a bit skewed, they have skewed hexons. So the mathematical representation would be something like this with a skew axis. And then what's also interesting, each protein can bind to something called a scaffolding protein. These are additional proteins that are needed for the formation of these containers. And what we want to understand is what the role of these scaffolding proteins are. So in order to do so, what we're doing is we are abstracting the structure, as you can see here. So this is a five-fold and a six-fold axis together. We then take note of the bonds, the different types of bonds. Here are bonds uh, when a pentagon, hexagon meet, and within a pentagon is magenta. Within a hexagon is magenta, unless it's along the skew axis, in which case we make it blue. So now we can again make a topological representation is all we need. So we every, every protein unit is just a dot now and every edge that connects them. So these two are connected by a pink edge. So this is two uh, blobs being connected by a pink edge and so on. So we can do this. And here's a little movie. Um, of, of that idea, we can then do assembly models on this and we can try to understand how they assemble. But then What's really interesting for us, we can now test different rules. So we can we can test in how far can the um, the scaffolding proteins play a similar role to the packaging signal. So are there any rules that could fully guarantee the efficient outcome? And obviously, we are we are working with different bond strengths, we make a phase space as physicists would do and try to understand is there, are there regimes in which the scaffolds are enough to, to guarantee this. And what's really interesting to us, and we're still working, obviously Carol is still here, we are only halfway through, but I just a little vignette from our work so far is the, is the thing that um, we, so again, this is an assembly intermediate, that's the corresponding um, interaction pattern. And what we found is if we you make some very um, biological uh, uh, justified assumptions, very simple assumptions on how scaffolding proteins locally interact with the proteins, we reproduce already a lot of experimental observations that Carol has made in her laboratory. For instance, um, our model predicts that if you have certain concentration of scaffolding protein versus um, the capsid protein, then you will get kinetic traps that are at about halfway um, filled to capsid. So again, this light gray here is just a template that's not been filled. And the, the other part is what's been filled in the model. And that fits precisely with what she's seen in experiments. So we, we can understand more and more um, how this works and our conclusions so far, and uh, that's what we are, we are basically seeing at the moment that DNA viruses have evolved a similar mechanism that also ensures efficient capsid assembly, but this mechanism no longer relies on these RNA codes, but it's encoded by extra proteins. So same principle idea, but a slightly different incarnation of the same theme. So now I hope I could show you that um, viral geometry really impacts on all aspects of our viral life cycle, in particular we've discussed assembly and disassembly here, and that geometry can also be an input into data analysis methods and in this case with us has enabled the discovery of virus assembly instructions. And as, as I've mentioned already, VIPs are virus-like particles, so we can use these containers as artificial particles to deliver um, therapeutic cargos 
to different to specific cell types. It can be therefore used in gene therapy, that's the angle that we are taking. It can be used in virus nanotechnology. And we are also um, having patterns that have to do with how to block the mechanism as a novel antiviral strategy. So as you've seen how important these packaging signals are, if you block their interactions, then you can ablate virus assembly. And we have also modeling in our in our group here, but we are looking at the consequences of such forms of therapy on a whole viral life cycle. But again, I didn't want to overload the talk, so do ask me if there are any questions about that. So finally, I'd like to thank my wonderful team in York. I've touched on the work of many, so I've hopefully mentioned not only the present, but also the alumni who have contributed to what we've uh, discussed today. Then we have a large-scale funding together with experimentalists and leads as a Welcome Trust Investigator Award. So we have multi-site team with, with experimental and theoretical postdocs. Then I've mentioned a couple of collaborators as well. And finally, the funding um, that funds the various aspects that I've talked about. And with this, I thank you for your attention and take questions. What? Okay, there I go. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we actually do have some questions. Uh, uh, the first one, does surface packing density pl play any role on why viruses assemble in icosahedral versus perfect spherical shape? That's a very good question. So uh, you, you, smaller viruses are more, all has icosahedral symmetry, but the smaller ones are more spherical in appearance. The larger ones are more faceted. This has to do with the elastic properties. So that's elasticity. So it's about um, it, basically the theory of elastic shells, if you wish. So that's, that would make the granulated um, appearance. But then you ask a good question about packing. So what actually ensures the packing? On, we should shouldn't forget that viruses have um, basically a thickness to them. So the protein shells have a thickness and the interfaces are designed to just fit in a specific way together. So, so from that point of view, yes, the packing relies on these interfaces and their geometry as much as the planar tilings, if you wish. Uh, then uh, same, uh, also a question by, uh, by Dr. Ibrahimi uh, from, uh, from the thermodynamics point of view, how much is the cohesive energy of one of these viruses in the formed assembly compared to if they were to assemble in a shape with a different symmetry? Oh, that's a really good question. Yes. So first of all, um, you can obviously think about the thermodynamics or the kinetics of the structure. And we, we looked at this. So for instance, there are models by someone called Roya Sandy. She's a biophysicist. And when you look at the kinetic buildup, what's important is at bending and stretching energy that, that, that plays a role. So you can potentially also get different shapes um, depending on how the bending and stretching energy plays out. She she has worked with Bogdan Dragnea, who's an experimentalist, and they have shown that you can get sometimes uh, under certain circumstances, this pans out to favor also non icosahedral um, geometries. It's very rare, but, but you can have this. Yes. Right, uh, next question from, uh, from Professor Morris Can a damaged capsid self reassemble? Oh, lovely. Yes. So I guess what you're meaning is when we're assembling and it's not fully assembled, can it build back and can it, um, can it then assemble? Yes, there is possibility for error correction. There is also the theory, again, from Bogdan's group, that maybe these partially assembled structures are there to fall apart again and then be a source of higher order intermediates. So imagine you want not just get individual protein building blocks come in, but pentagons and hexagons. So you can imagine that it does hierarchical assembly, does, does larger patches and they come together. And the idea is that these broken ones, as you call them, these not complete ones, that they could fall apart and deliver these sort of building blocks. Right. Any other questions from, uh, uh, from the audience? There is, there is, there is none in... Uh, um, right. So there's a last one here. Um, Uh, does this also relate to the intermolecular interaction between the proteins and their building block uh, in terms of packing density here? 
Does this also relate to the intermolecular interaction between the protein and their building blocks? Yeah, I mean, the, the proteins are kind of the building blocks, but you're quite right. It is actually the interaction are really important. So the bond strengths are absolutely important. And, uh, if, and, and they might not be the same, or they actually mostly are not the same along all the edges. So that really has bearing on the outcome of the assembly. And we take this into account. Right. Any, any other questions? There are currently no open questions. So before we thank the speaker, I think there's also a word of thanks that should go to the SES Speaker Organizing Committee. Uh, this year, it is chaired by Dr. Joe Carney. And the Faculty of Science and Engineering is delighted to continue our tradition of hosting the speaker series as part of, of Research and Innovation Week. And a reminder to the attendees that there are other RNI Week events that, that we can join this week. And so with this, I think we will thank the speaker and have a sort of fantastic reaction. If there's a reaction button, but anyways, <laughs> I think it's. A... <clears throat> and um, with this, uh, thank you all for coming. And again, a reminder that there are other events this week which I hope will be all as entertaining as this one. All right. Thank all right. you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right.